I ask you not for whatever you do. I know. Whatever you do, please keep it impersonal. I we do not need to be personal up here. Alright, because it's not fair. It's not fair and it's not it really, really it's not professional on our part. No more dinks at anybody whose wife is this and whatever is that. I'm telling you right now, it's not very professional and I don't think I think it's a problem. So I I ask you and I don't want because of someone's a uh, comment, uh, another legislator is going to go and, and defend uh, the individual, but I'm telling you right now, if we don't uh, become personal, I think we avoid a lot of problems. And so now, where's our... I understand, and, and if, I, if I apologize, if I offended no, no, anyone, no, no, I apologize. No, 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 apologize. All I'm saying is that certain witnesses have to be sworn in, as per the county charge. No, 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 Tim, you're going to say your last name because I don't want to butcher it. Thank you. It's uh, Tim LaChapelle. Oh, uh, I said it right, LaChapelle. Yeah. Okay. Right. Good job. Go ahead. Talk to us, Tim. Um, my name is Tim LaChapelle. I'm the legislative liaison for the Long Island Board of Realtors. Mm -hmm. um, today, I speak. Thank you. Um, Presiding Officer Gonzalez and all the members of the legislature for allowing me to speak. Um, I speak today with a proxy of the Long Island Board of Realtors, the Long Island Builders Institute, the LIA, Long Island Association, the New York State Land Title Association, the Commercial Industrial Broker Society of Long Island, and the Association for a Better Long Island. We call on the Nassau County Legislator to reject the portion of the County Executive's budget that raises the mortgage recording fee from $300 to $350 per block. The 2016 budget increased the tax map verification by 200%, $75 to $225. The per block recording fee was increased by another 100%. It went from $150 to $300. These fees were exorbitant and they were passed so quickly that homeowners, brokers, and land title companies didn't have the time to adjust their practices to these fees. And thanks to the lobbying efforts of the New York State Land Title Association, um, the Nassau County Legislature got our message and delayed the fee hikes until January. We appreciate that the county responded to the initial crisis created by the increase in fees. Um, however, it's clear that after the most recent executive budget proposal that um, they're missing the big picture. We fear that another increase, one year after the largest one in the history of the county, sets a dangerous precedent that can involve annual increases levied on the real estate industry. Furthermore, we don't believe that the county has taken enough time to observe and analyze the effects of the initial fee increases in real estate and other sectors of our economy. Targeting the real estate industry for revenue is short-sighted because it fails to recognize the positive economic impact that a home sale has on the economy. The National Association of Realtors estimates that every home sale produces about $69,000 in economic stimulation uh, to a locality. This includes expenditures on moving, uh, truck services, consumer items, um, eating out at dinner, and I believe that this value is actually much higher when you take account, into account the high cost of living on Long Island. The proponents of this fee increase fail to realize that these Increases negatively affect more than just the real estate market. Increasing home purchasing costs will create a drag on local economies and further will negatively impact sales tax revenue. The increased fees neg negatively affect all aspects of the real estate market, but we'd have, like to draw special attention to affordable housing. Long Island has a high demand for both aff available and affordable housing. Young people working on Long Island and in the city, retired citizens looking to downsize, 
and low-income families all make up this need. Unfortunately, regulations that send closing costs soaring and creates another financial obstacle for the people who wish to access this housing. As advocates for the public, we, the forum, aforementioned industry groups, call on the leadership in both counties to consider the short and long-term effects of these fees. Um, I'd like to point out um, that these fees, the regressive nature of these fees, um, you know, there's large commercial properties that only have one lot, and then there's also, you know, a home, a one-family home that may be on three lots. And the person on that one home has to pay an extremely large fee if he wants to refinance or if somebody wants to purchase that house. Um, but, you know, a, a facility like Roosevelt Field, which, which has... Sorry, your time has expired. Thank you. Um, just a place like Roosevelt Field would end up having to pay only on one lot. Um, so I think we could maybe relook at these, how these fees are um, charged on commercial groups and on homeowners and possibly, you know, improve the nature of the fees so that it's more equitable. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ken. All right. Okay. All right. Now, the next, next part is the Office of Minority Affairs, I believe. as well as the Bernardi leader and the legislative body for the opportunity. Um, my name is Shelley Brasley. I've been serving as acting executive director of the Office of Minority Affairs since May 27. Um, I, from what I understand, you guys have some questions for me. Our budget, um, well, we're going to do the best we can to work with the budget that we have for our department. Um, in looking the first couple of months at our department and looking at the charter, uh, we've made some changes as far as assignments and staff is concerned. We've decided that it makes more sense to look at capacity building for our MWBEs um, and outreach so that the MWBEs are in a position to bid for the contracts. We've also looked at things like um, our, our uh, MWBE goals for the Bay Park projects are well over 20%. Uh, the DBE goals, we've exceeded those goals over the last two, three years. And uh, we no longer have um, project, we no, we no longer have mandated goals. So um, we've exceeded our goals, so now what we can do is race neutral which means that we send out the information and uh, the DBE community has been uh, responding and we are exceeding our goals without man putting goals on the contracts. So we're doing very well in our office. We could do a lot more with what the charter mandates we should do. Um, and I'd like to know if you guys have questions for me. Okay. Uh, yeah, just real quick, the, uh, yeah. so you did mention that the uh, woman-owned businesses, you make sure that they get uh, 
uh, their fair share of the contracts, right? Their percentage. Minority and women-owned businesses yeah, okay. now service disabled veterans. And that service, okay, that part I didn't hear about the veterans because we did tag them on mid-year that veteran, disabled veterans would be, uh, so you already included them. Okay, I, I didn't hear that part. And the other thing was that Madam Chair, I think, asked about the, um, the position in the budget of the executive director. Is that being addressed as being? That, that, has, that was addressed yesterday. I think they caught the mistake yesterday and it was addressed. That's all the question. Right? Thank you so much. You have a question. You said that you have exceeded your goals regarding MWRBP. No. Disadvantaged Business Enterprise, which is a federal program, opposed to MWBE, which is state. Okay. So, can you explain how you were able to exceed the goal for the, uh, for the other program? Well, with the DBE program, which is um, primarily with NICE Bus, uh, we have a triennial uh, goal period, and um, the goal is established every three years. We exceeded the goals. Um, simply with outreach and working together with nice bus um, if we send the infant first of all if a goal is in the contract we usually meet it if there is no goal in the contract then the vendors don't feel like there is a need to really try to meet or exceed it so in in the cases where we have contracts on a state level as well as federal level when the RFPs go out and contractors know in advance what the goal is, then it's put in the contract, then we typically meet the goal. Um, in a case where we have contracts and there's just a clause EE and there's no number or percentage attached to it, there's nothing to work for. And, you know, so typically when we look at our numbers, they're for state and federal contracts, not necessarily contracts that are funded with county money. Legislative Ford. Good evening. That, I'm over here. Thank you very much. I know it's late and you've been here all day. But um, I, I just want to maybe get some clarification. When you talk about the goal that you have, is that the goal like that would be, like when you say it would be stated in the, when you send out an RFP, you know, for contracts, I guess, is it the goal that you're looking, are you explicitly asking for, um, a percentage of women or minority owned businesses, I mean, uh, to respond? Yeah, typically, when an RFP is sent out, right. it already establishes what the goal is. If there is, if it's if it's 20% goal, it could be 10% for women, 10% for minorities. Okay. Um, the contract will specify. Yeah. So, so that's what I mean. And then once the RFP has been answered and you select the vendor, then they have to, send my office a utilization plan. Then we look at the utilization plan and how they are going to use the minority or women on businesses. businesses. But right. now you also though, like when you send the RFPs out, I mean, because uh, I know one of the keys would be that uh, vendors or businesses, contractors or whatever would be registered with the county. So that if an RFP is issued, they would be able to uh, be notified, you know, to go on that, like the county is issuing an RFP, like say to rebuild a bridge or something like that. So that all, anybody who's registered would know about this. And I mean, you could still get a, a paper copy if you're not registered, but a lot of times if you're registered, you would almost automatically get notified that an RFP has been issued about something. And it's up to you to determine if you want to respond to it or not, correct? That, that is correct, but nine times out of ten, if you don't network with prime vendors, you're not yeah. going to be selected. Right. So there has to be some other vehicle in which we can bring minority and women-owned businesses and veteran disabled businesses, yeah. Section 3 businesses, yeah. all the businesses that we may or may not have a goal in a contract. Yeah. We need to figure out a way to bring them together with the prime contractors because just a name is not going to work <laughs> by most primes. Right. You have to make some kind of relationship. Right. But but also, then, do you take into consideration that if it ha happens to be a vendor who's responding, that may be already a, like a woman on this vendor, like a vendor who's a, already a woman? I mean, does, does the fact that she's willing to she fulfill that requirement of like meeting a 10 to 20% of having, you know, of contracts being issued? 
If a woman or minority owned business is yeah. selected as the prime, yeah, then you have a hundred percent goal. It's okay. a win win. Yeah. Okay. All right, and then how do you, um, how is it that you reach out to uh, the women and minority and the veteran owned businesses? How, uh, you know, a lot of times, like you may find that these small little businesses, and they may not be aware that they need, to, say, to establish a relationship with a bigger company or a vendor who may be able to hire them, you know, to do a certain job, you know? How, is there any way that, that, you reach out to them, like the Office of Minority Affairs reaches out and lets them all know, or? Well, since, since I've started, um, like I said, capacity building and outreach has been our primary focus. And so what we will do is have, they're, they're, in some cases, um, they, they, they may have some financial issues, they, they may have, there's all kinds of issues that small businesses have. So we try to provide opportunities where they can learn. So we've been partnering with SBA, we've been partnering with BWE, we've been partnering, uh, we have something coming up with uh, New York Community Bank, where there's a four okay. series, so that, so that these yeah. vendors can take these classes that will help build capacity so that they're positioned to be able to bid for the, for the uh, You know, and, and I, just two quick things after that. I, I did go to something at the MLK Center in Long Beach about two years ago, Mrs. Stone uh, ran it, and it was very interesting to me about how to start up a small business. And I, I, am not, I was just there just to learn. But the information that I received was like, wow, like, you know, uh, helping people to be able to do this, very common sense approach and, and with the networking. So I, you know, I thought it was very informative. But then I would ask you, what is it, as we as legislators, how can we, how can we help you? What can we do for you to be able to reach out and maybe start a more com comprehensive approach so that you don't have to rely upon community national bank or something? How is it that we can help you so that we can maybe set up like a, a not forum where we can come into our community maybe, uh, you know, publicize it to try to see if we can grant people to come in. Would you be, able to be willing to work with us and help us bring in the resources so we can maybe educate and maybe we can help you in this pursuit? I absolutely would. In September, we had a major forum at Crest Hollow uh, Country Club. We do things on large and small um, basis. In June, I had something in the Latino community and someone from the governor's office came and did the presentation in Spanish. Um, and later on with um, Legislator Bino, I, I did something in uh, Westbury, and I had someone from the governor's office come that spoke Creole for the Haitian community. We are constantly trying to bridge the gap with small, and small, I, it's more effective in small groups because we get to address specific okay. needs for, yeah. for those groups. But anytime, I mean, I always welcome uh, an opportunity to make things better for our small businesses. Yeah. I thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, Legislative by now. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Good evening, Ms. Boisley. Good evening. So, I appreciate hearing that we met our goals in the um, efforts for DBE. And so I know that the requirements of your office is, is really, you know, it's vast. It's, it's, surpasses just DBE. Um, there are, as far as I can read in terms of the budget and just having some knowledge of how some of these departments work, that you would have a responsibility to also oversee the grant fundings that we receive from the uh, Department of Justice, from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, from the Department of Transportation, from GOSAR, and also from the Department of Labor. Um, I don't know what that total is in terms of grant funding. Um, I'd like to, some, somewhere or another, receive that information. But for today's conversation, um, I, I want to talk about um, the importance of us maintaining our compliance as it relates to those grants. And um, this is twofold. You want to make sure that the um, targeted entities, minority women-owned businesses, um, distressed business um, enterprises, veterans, and um, 
and the like receive an opportunity. Um, and, and so that's the number one primary concern, right? And then the second would be that if we don't do what we're supposed to do, that we're, we're failing to be in compliance and there's a potential for a clawback for them to come and take this money away from the county. And so that the, the, the grant money that we receive is, is, is in large numbers. And so my concern today is based on the fact that the, the staffing levels of, of your department. And um, I think it's great that you know there was a mistake and you know they went back and fixed you know that there was no executive director and um, now the position is, is there for an executive director. Um, but I, I, I requested to see what was requested from the department and what was actually being presented um, for adoption by this body. And I, I do see that there's a variance um, for a full-time position. And so my, my concern is that given the magnitude of um, the amount of work and, and the potential for loss of, of funding, um, whether you feel that you can legitimately carry out the duties of your office, um, especially since, and I don't think it's a burden, but I, I think that, you know, legislator Gaylor and Curran put together wonderful legislation that would include veteran-owned businesses, and I don't want it to be a toothless piece of legislation. We need to be able to have resources and have the potential of achieving those goals. So my question today, long-winded, sorry, my question today is, um, do you think this, it's one position in, in, in the grand scheme of like corrections and police where there's thousands of, of off, you know, officers at police and hundreds of officers for corrections, we're talking about you know, a small entity, a small department trying to do a lot of work. Do you feel that you're in a position to do that minus this one position? And what was that position? Well, um, we could always use more help. Um, as we change things around in the office, it's going to require more. One of, one of the things that I was requesting was that we would be able to do project-specific goals. Um, that is a tremendous undertaking, but it would ensure that the county contracts would at least have goals. Right now, we don't. Um, and I think project-specific goals, according to the rules, we can look to them. Um, and they are, in my opinion, legally defense, defensive, if, if, if defensible if we had to go into a court of law. Now, it would mean that every contract that's over $100,000 before it was, it, it was in the RFP form, I would have to get all the specs from that um, particular bid and create a goal if it was project specific. So what I would be looking at if there were engineers involved, I would look at the universe of engineers and then the MWBE universe and come up with. So if it was plumbing, engineering, construction, whatever, whatever components were going to be in that contract, I would have to look at them all and devise a goal based on the, the scope of work. Um, that would require a little more time, but I think that it would certainly provide goals for uh, MWBEs and well, service dis disabled because when you when you wrote the um, the proposal, you you put a six percent goal in there, so then there really isn't any figuring out. But there are no goals on those contracts for MWBEs. So, okay, and I, I hear you. And so there was a question by one of the legislators here that said, you know, what can this body do to support the efforts of the Office of Minority Affairs? And so at this point, I have no more questions for you. My, my, I wanted to just engage my colleagues to say that um, there was a request made for an additional body in that, in that department. And I think that, I think what that department does to this point is, is, is huge. Um, and the requirements placed on their shoulders is, is it's, it's, a, it's not a burden, but it's, it's a heavy lift. And I think that if they're not resourced properly um, and their request was for an additional person, that we should consider that. Um, I, I would also go further to say 
that um, we as a body should be moving forward with putting a permanent, having some permanency in there, having a permanent executive director in that position. I think that the, the stakes are too high. The stakes are way too high for us not to resource this department properly. And so um, that's, that's the answer to the question. I, I believe it was Legislator um, Ford who asked it. That, that to me is the answer to the question. So um, I would look forward to seeing this body um, consider um, the permanency of an executive director. And I'd like to see this body join me in having discussions with the, um, the executive branch of this county government about restoring that additional position that was requested by the head of the department. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Braisley, uh, I have a question. Yes. Do you, is there a job description for that, that uh, uh, additional employee that you would like to see in the Office of Minority Affairs? What would that person to be uh, responsible for? I, I was a project director. So my position as project director was cut, and then the executive director was... Uh, oh, so in other words, that person would be a project director? That's correct. And what would be the responsibilities of that project director? Just a few. Well, well what did you do? I, I, <laughs> I did the, um, the goals. I did the utilization plans, I did cultural affairs, I did um, the educational component, I, we did, I did everything that the office does. Okay, you, did, you were multitasked. Okay, so you're actually asking for a project director, correct? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. All right, that's all I do. Uh, okay, legislative current. I had a lot to say today. Hi. <laughs> so it's you and four others? at the moment? Well, working in our office is me and two others. So it's you and two others. And are they full-time or part-time? They are full-time. They're full-time. So is there another person or two floating around in other departments? On our budget? Yeah, on your budget, yes. But yes, specifically on your budget. Yes. They are. How many? Two. So you have you and two who work in your office, and then there's two others who comes out of your budget, but they, they, they don't report to you. That's correct. So can everybody hear that up here? Okay, and, and stop me if I said this incorrectly. Ms. Braisley is running the office. She's got two people full time with her. There are two other people who are paid for out of her budget line, but they are in other departments and they don't report to her. So you don't have four people. She's got four on the budget, but two in the office, and two are tasked in, I don't know. Do you, do you happen to, uh, I don't know, we're going to be putting her on the spot, sorry. I don't want to, I don't want to put her on the spot. We'll find out. Uh, Ms. Braisley, but it might be nice to know, maybe we could ask the administration where they are. Yes. Yeah. Because as, there are charter mandated duties to this office, and not only is it less than perhaps is needed, the ones that are there, half of them aren't even there. I think that's the problem. But they're being paid by. But they uh, come out of the budget, budget of the Office of Minority Affairs. Okay. Uh, Legislator Salak. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Also, my concern is that not just anyone filled the executive, executive director position, but the most qualified person fills that seat. Um, Article uh, 21 mis miscellaneous officers, section 2012 of the county charter, county charter, uh, paragraph number three says that the Office of Minority Affairs shall have the following powers and duties. A, assist the various officers of the county government in improving the delivery of quality services such as social services. B, provide the county executive and the county legislature with the minority community impact assessments. Uh, C, provide assess an opportunity for minority participation in county contract and procurement programs. D, develop and improve the county women and minority business enterprise programs. E, produce and publish any research papers or studies as issues affecting the minority community. F, provide assistance in the implementation of an affirmative action programs in county government. Uh, and G, uh, administer the county's affirmative action program. I mean, that, that's a very, you know, there's a lot of duties and
powers of the office. And I'm concerned that you know, with only one person and two people in addition supporting you and two other persons in another department, we fall short of the goal of this office. And so and as a result, we don't have true inclusion, we have the perception of, of inclusion. Are you concerned with the, with the, with the staffing of your office? Well, uh, yes, I am concerned. However, since I've been there, I've been writing corrective action measures, on, and in some case, compliance corrective measures. Um, I have not, I mean, I started at that top of that charter. I've not had an opportunity to address everything because there is a time met, uh, issue and, and a manpower issue. Right. So we, yes, I'm concerned, and we are looking at doing what we can with what we have. I would hope that the administration provides you the sufficient resources you need in order to complete uh, the important task. Um, another question, have you been actively working with the Director of Procurement and Compliance? Well, he, he recently was hired as well. So yes, we have been working, working together. Okay, please explain in detail what actions have been taken to improve minority participation. With the Director of Purchasing? Yes, yeah. Procurement. I'm, well, I'm at procurement. I'm sorry. Um, well, we, we're right now looking at the procurement rules and regulations. However, my biggest concern is our ability to make sure that we have numbers in the contract. Because if we don't, if we don't have those numbers in the RFPs, we're not going to be able to do that. And if we don't have the, the ability to perhaps look at the RFPs before they're even led and try to figure out how we can debundle them so that they can meet the needs of smaller businesses. Some, some of the jobs are just too big for a small business, but we could probably look at some of them and debundle some of it so that we can provide opportunities for small businesses so that they can grow. And an example of that is at Stony Brook, for instance, when they, had, they were building a hospital, there was a painter. Um, and he could not do a $2 million paint job. He just didn't have the capacity. What they did was they pulled out all the stairwells in the hospital, and they, they, they priced that out, and they had painters, small businesses, bid on it. So now you, you win that. The part that you're doing is clearly separate from everything else. It helped to build capacity. It helped to build his portfolio. It showed that he was on a huge job, and now he's very successful and he's able to move forward. He was able to hire some other people. So there's some, there are some things that we can do and I've already met with um, Sheila Shaw and I, I, I've met with um, Mr. Cleary and we've been discussing some of these things and some of these things are what we want to do, um, but we just have to position ourselves to be able to. Do Understood. That. Um, but I'm concerned that the lack of sufficient resources uh, provide just a perception. My last question is B. Uh, uh, excuse me, my last question pertains to subsection B, paragraph 3 in the county charter, which states that the Office of Minority Affairs is a commission with an obligation and duty to provide the county executive and the county legislature with a minority community impact assessment study. When was the last time you provided such a study? Well, I've just been in this position since May 27th. When was the last time that your office, before you, submitted that assessment? I don't recall, since I've been there, it being um, pre presented to you. Well, I encourage your office, please, to conduct uh, a minority community impact assessment. Thank you. Uh, Eric, are you sitting there for a reason? <laughs> <laughs> are you going to be able to tell us why? There are five in the budget, and only it's only her and two others. Are you able to tell us that? Yes, I can. OK. All Ready. right. So as was stated, there are you know, two people who report directly to Ms. Brazley. The other two people report to the Deputy County Executive for Minority Affairs and Human Resources, and Human, so and human Sources, um, that's Dr. Elliott. So, so while they are, they are paid out of Minority Affairs budget, they are doing outreach work, whereas Ms. Brazley is focused more on the contracting and improving um, business opportunities for people. I said that she was project director before she became executive director. And that's the position she's trying to fill in, in the budget. Is there a possibility that that could be done? 
it was our feeling as we were looking at the overall budget, you know, we took a look at vacancies, some were eliminated, this one was, and essentially our position was until we actually get a disparity study done, you know, which, you now we've come to the legislative for, for funding, but we couldn't get that funding, so we can't really work on the goals that are necessary, so it's kind of, to have people working on stuff that they can't work on, we felt that wasn't the best decision. I think after the disparity study is completed, we have more information on setting the proper goals, then we can relook at adding additional staff because they will actually have you know, more projects to work on at that point. Can I ask a follow-up on that? Hold on, one at a time. I'd like to go to somebody who was not being uh, before legislators. Uh, you, you mentioned a disparity study that was voted down, and, and just earlier, uh, Legislative Lodge has asked about a number of studies. Is that is that the same thing as a disparity study, or is there something different? I didn't hear all of his um, questioning, so. But I think as you, as this body is aware, you know we, this body approved, you know, a capital project of five hundred thousand dollars to to perform a disparity study, but unfortunately, since we don't have the bonding approval. We cannot um, work on that. What about me? Yeah. Okay. So now what? Okay. Uh, are you okay? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Now, legislator Ford. Uh, Eric, also in the budget, there are five full times. So you clarified why there's two roaming people that are not directly reporting to Ms. Baisley, right? But Correct. What about the part-time and seasonal? There's three people that are in the budget for, for that department. Well, actually, um, Ms. Bracey requested the third additional part-time person, so that's in a, a new position that we did, okay. did include. All right. And what, would, there, would they work like just like during the summer or something, or would you bring them in? Part-time. Yeah. I, I, I would need them now. I, I'm gonna, I need them now, and they'll work part-time in the office. Do you have any part-time workers now working with you, or is it just you and the two people right now? Right now, it's just the three of us. Okay, so then, so then it's in the budget. So I guess you would be able to bring in the necessary, people, you know, personnel to help you at this point, and then we could work on hopefully once we do the study. Hopefully, then we'll be able to bring it in and get you back a project director, so you know you can get this full steam ahead. That's correct. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Bracey. Thank you, everyone, for, for clarifying that. And I think we have a little work to do um, to assist the Office of Minority Affairs. Uh, but some of the questions.